Welcome back. We find ourselves in Ruth. This is an exciting time because so far as we've been going through the, uh, the Old Testament, we've been dealing with books that are of multiple chapters, right? First, first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, 50 chapters. And we've been running through books that have been going into the chapters of the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, even the 50s that are in Genesis. We come now to, so far, what is the smallest book of the Old Testament. So far. We'll find smaller ones as we go. But at this point in Ruth, we come across just this little four-chapter book that, even though it is small in its size, is very, very important in our study of understanding the Old Testament. You'll see this as we, as we go on. So let's introduce the book to you. Uh, this is what we would say, first of all, that Ruth is one of the beautiful love stories of the Bible. We say one of the beautiful love stories of the Bible because there are more than just one love story in, in the Bible, right? But this is the first one, kind of, that we, that we come across. And what's interesting about this, when you go back into the Jewish tradition, okay, the, uh, the book of Ruth was written on a separate scroll from the other Old Testament books. The reason for this was because of the place that the book of Ruth would hold in the festivities and the festivals that the Jewish people would hold. The book of Ruth was a separate scroll that was held back, and it would be brought out once a year to be read at Pentecost. Pentecost in the, in the old Jewish um, traditions, if you remember when we were talking about the festivals and holidays of the Jewish people, Pentecost was the harvest festival. Okay? Remember, Ruth, what was the main story, or what was the main activity that she was involved in as the story of Ruth unfolds? She was harvesting in Boaz's fields, right? That's why Ruth is read during the Harvest Festival and talks about, not just about the love story between Ruth and Boaz, but also talks about that enduring hope that the Jewish people have of God being the Redeemer of His people. And we'll see that as, as we go. Boaz that male character, the one who marries Ruth, right? Boaz, we would say, is a type of Christ the Redeemer. Again, we'll see this as we go a little further in our study of Ruth. And what Boaz does is he woos and marries Ruth. And Ruth, we would say, is a type of Christ's church. So as Boaz marries Ruth, that is a type or a picture or a symbol of Christ redeeming his church. Now, we're just saying this now in the introduction. You may not get the connection yet. Don't worry about it. As we go a little further, I think we'll see the connection. And it will become more, more clear to us. This book gives us the events that took place in the days when the judges governed. All right? We've just gone through judges. And we saw those seven cycles of, of rulership with regard to those judges. Ruth takes place during the time of the judges. It's written at a different time, but what it's written about and the history that it writes about is during the days of the judges. And what Ruth does is it, is it gives us an idea of what the domestic life of Israel kind of was like during that period of the anarchy, okay? The reason why we call it the anarchy is because, remember, there was no king, and uh, the judges ruled, but only when <laughs> there were problems going on. So, to give us a little bit of a, of a geographical idea of, of what we're doing here and what we're covering in Ruth, when we begin the uh, account of Ruth, we find ourselves in this area of the land, the area of Moab. This is here where, because of the famine previous, uh, 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 Naomi, who lived in this area, goes over into this area. Okay, in order to be preserved of, of the famine that is taking place over here. It's here where Naomi's sons find Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth, and they marry uh, together. In fact, uh, Ruth's husband is also part of all of this. And the, tragi the tragedy that happens is not only does Naomi lose her husband to death, but also both of her sons to death. So now Naomi is a widow, Ruth is a widow, Orpah is a widow, all, it seems, around the same amount of time, 
And so as a result of this tragedy, as they are here, what Naomi is going to do is she's going to travel back to her homeland here. Okay? It's here where we begin the story. It's here where the story will end. So that kind of gives you a, an idea of the, of the geography and uh, what's happening uh, there in the book of Ruth. Now, the chief purpose of the book is really found in the last chapter and the last verses. Notice as we go there, chapter 4, beginning at verse 17, here is what helps us to understand why Ruth is preserved for us. Beginning in verse 17, also the neighbor women gave him a name saying, this is, the, this is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Beginning to get the idea now why this book is important, we're now starting to fill in some gaps with regard to the family tree. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. So here now we begin to understand why this little four chapter book is nestled in between the end of Judges and the beginning of 1 Samuel. We're now going to see how the nation will transition from being a nation that is led by Judges now into a period where the nation will begin to have a monarchy beginning with King Saul. Ruth is that connector, okay, for us to help us understand how this comes to be. So, God was soon to allow Israel to have kings, and so by way of preparation, the book of Ruth, what it does for us is it introduces the kingly line. That's why we come across the name David, which is a, uh, a marker for us, or a, or a flag for us, right? As soon as we come across the name David, we're going, okay, now uh, I'm starting to get some, some ideas with regard to the history. So Ruth is our connector for us, okay? And we'll see even more than this with regard to its significance, but we'll, we'll go with that for now. So, let's work with an outline of this book. And what I've done is I've taken the book of Ruth and divided its four chapters and given each chapter a title, okay? So, chapter one, we begin with Ruth's sorrow. She's lost her husband. Not only has she lost her husband, but her sister lost her husband. Naomi, her mother-in-law, has lost her husband. We begin with Ruth's sorrow. By the time we get into chapter two, we then get into what we call Ruth's service. As Naomi and Ruth go back to Bethlehem, in the area of Bethlehem, it is here where Ruth begins to support not only herself, but also her mother-in-law by gleaning in the fields of Boaz. Okay, remember, being a widow in Ruth's day was a tragic situation because there are no, so any so there are no uh, social safety nets to depend upon. You do not have a pension that you can, that you can draw off of at the death of your husband or anything like that. Basically, a widow is left on her own, and unless the family come and help her out, she is not going to be able to do anything. That would probably be the prime reason why Naomi is going back to Bethlehem. She's going to go back to family, okay, and hopefully be supported there. And would family have been obliged to help out? Yes. And what if they chose not to, what would? There would be legal proceedings that would take place. And this is why Ruth is interesting for us as well, because it helps us to understand some of the legal process of what happens when a next of kin refuses to take care of the situation that they're obligated to take care of, what then happens? Well, this is where Boaz comes into play, all right? And we'll see that as we go a little further. So we go from Ruth's sorrow to Ruth's service. Chapter 3 then talks about Ruth's surrender. This is where Ruth, now at the prompting of Naomi, says, listen, uh, you've got a good thing going here, and I think, you know, I think he likes you, uh, that, that kind of thing. And, and Ruth surrenders herself to the authority of Boaz as Boaz becomes the kinsman redeemer for Ruth, primarily. By connection, Naomi will also be included in that. But, but Boaz is the kinsman redeemer of Ruth, primarily. So that by the time we get into chapter 4, we see Ruth's satisfaction. Boaz and Ruth are brought together. And the rest, as they say, is history. And when we get into the purpose of this union between Boaz and Ruth, we begin to see how the family tree will continue to develop in the Davidic line. Because who comes through the Davidic line? The Messiah comes through the Davidic line. Isn't that interesting now? Okay. And 
we then see really how Ruth and its placement in the canon for us is quite significant. So let's do some background work on this book. Let's first of all talk about the title. Why is it titled Ruth? Well, because it, it's named after Tarot, right? Ruth is the heroine of this book. Uh, this is the first. Now, there will be other instances in the Old Testament scriptures where we'll find women taking a prominent role in the uh, accounts as it's shared. But Ruth is basically the very first one that we come across that really centers on a female heroine. The name Ruth, of course, may be a Moabite modification of the Hebrew name Reut. Okay? Is how you pronounce that. There'd be other ones that were pronounced maybe slightly different, but that gives you the idea, okay? And Ruth means friendship or, or association. So it kind of uh, gives you uh, uh, the characteristic of who this person was as well. When we think of Ruth, what's some of the things that we often think about? We think of a kindly, gentle woman who is devoted to her mother-in-law, you know, all the rest of those good things, friendship, association, all wrapped up into that. Now, Remember, Ruth is a Moabite woman. Now, let's do a little bit of, of uh, 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 connecting here that makes it very interesting for us as we continue to think about the history of Israel. The Moabite people, they are descendants of which Old Testament character? Lot. I learned that last year. Yeah. <laughs> Lot. Okay. Remember Lot and, and, and Abraham? Lot was Abraham's nephew. They were together for a while, and then they split to share the land after a while. It was through Lot that the Moabite people come to be. So isn't that interesting now? The Moabite people, especially through Ruth now, are going to have a link back into the Israelite nation. Okay? In a million years, they would never have thought it. Okay? But God, as he continues his work in his people's lives, has a way of bringing Lot's line back into all of what he's planning in his redemptive plan. Okay, So that's, that's an interesting side fact with regard to Ruth and God's involvement with her. Date and author? We really don't know who the author is. Okay, The, the author is really not known. It's possible that Samuel may have been the author, but uh, we really can't say for sure. If Samuel was the author, then we would have to say this, that it was then probably written during the reign of King David. So, understand the time gap that we're talking about here. Ruth shares about the time of the judges. That's when that's happened, during the time of judges. If Samuel was writing this, he was not writing it until after the time of the judges is gone. King Saul's reign is over, and now we're into the reign of King David. Okay? So the events that Ruth talks about is written about much later. Okay? And I think one of the reasons why it was written later was because, what's Ruth? It's that connecting link between the time of the judges and the beginning of the monarchy and the family line and the Davidic line and all the rest of it. There's a purpose behind the delay, I think, in the, in the writing of it. Of course, Ruth could not have been written before then. Why? Because David's name appears, right? It appears at the, at the last of the, of the book. Because of the significance of the name of David, all right, that gives us a bit of a timeline again, or a hint at the timeline of when this may have been written, okay? Uh, of course, you know, when Ruth and, and Boaz have their children, who is it, who is it that uh, is the child of Boaz and Ruth? It's Obed. It's David's grandfather. Well, at that time, they don't know who that David's going to exist, right? So it's interesting how those little linguistic clues uh, give us something. But notice Solomon isn't mentioned in the line. It's only David. Perhaps the reason for that is because... Uh, this book was written very early in David's reign. Okay? Very early in David's reign. Okay? So, uh, yeah, as we said, as we just said, yeah, it may have been written sometime before the time of Solomon, since his name is not included in the genealogy. Okay? And it is very likely that the author was a contemporary of David. And so that's why we're thinking possibly Samuel. 
But again, we're not going to jump, on, jump up and down on that because we have no definitive way of saying it. But an idea nonetheless. Let's talk about Ruth's place in the canon. Remember, she follows the judges. And she's placed there to fit the chronological sequence. So even though the book is written at a later time, during David's reign, it's so important to have Ruth in there. Because she's that, uh, we could almost say, that missing link. That if we didn't have Ruth there, we wouldn't, we wouldn't understand how that gap between the time of the judges and the beginning of the Davidic monarchy takes place. We wouldn't have that idea and that understanding. So that's why Ruth is so important for us. So again, even though it's just 40 chapters, it's such a, a pivotal book for us to, to know about and to see what uh, it is telling us about. So let's talk about some main purposes of Ruth. And, and there's basically four main purposes behind this book of Ruth. First, again, as we've already talked about, we're talking about genealogy. It introduces a few of the ancestors of David, and especially the royal lineage of Christ, because by the time we get to Matthew, and by the time we get to Luke, and Matthew and Luke record the family line of Jesus, starting with Jesus, going all the way back to the beginning of the, of the, of the root of the tree, right? We find that the, the Davidic line is involved, okay? Uh, and what's also interesting is the prominence of the inclusion of non-Israelite people in this line. Again, remember, Ruth is a Moabite. She's not an Israelite. Was um, Boaz's mom, was she a Moabite? Uh, she, she was part of the city of Jericho. And we'll get there as we, as we continue on, which is another interesting factor of how God even includes non-Israelite people in Christ's line, okay? Ruth being the prominent one there. Typology is another main purpose of Ruth. The kinsman redeemer, that's Boaz, okay, is the prominent messianic type, okay? We would say that Ruth is a type of the church, okay? The scriptures, especially when we get into the New Testament, talk about the church being the bride of Christ. That, especially in Revelation, when it talks about the wedding feast, the bride being prepared for, for her groom, those are terms and symbols to talk about the church being prepared in its relationship with Christ. Okay? So Boaz is a type or a, or a symbol of, of, of the Messiah. Ruth is a type or symbol of the church, and as we see Boaz and Ruth come together, that typifies Christ and the church coming together. This is where we, we begin to get into some of the theological purpose behind Ruth too. So we're not just talking about the genealogical, genealogical purpose, we're not just talking about the typology and its purpose, but we also have to take a look at the theology and its purposes in Ruth as well. Underlying the entire book, is its revelation of the character and ways of God. We have a famine take place. Oh no, what's going to happen? Don't worry. God has it under control. And he does. Oh no, Naomi's husband dies, Ruth's husband dies, Orpah's husband dies. What are we going to do now? Don't worry about it. God's got it all under control. It's all part of the plan. And so even though Naomi and Ruth don't see the plan, even though Orpah doesn't see the plan, even though Boaz at this point doesn't see the plan, God is still at work doing what he promised he would do. I will lead you. I will guide you. Don't worry about it. We'll work this through. And we see God being revealed in many ways through all what takes place during this time of Ruth's life. We see incidences of his providence, right? We see evidence of his sovereignty. We see his grace. We see his holiness. We see his invitation of salvation to to, to all peoples, right? We see all of these things as we read just those four chapters and we see the character and the nature of God being revealed in a way that hasn't really been revealed to this extent in the Old Testament until now, okay? So another reason why Ruth is so important. Of course, we have to talk about the historical purpose as well. What Ruth does for us is describe here a few intimate experiences of a godly family that resided where? Is it interesting? Resided in Bethlehem. 
That's where Naomi was from. That's where her family was from. That's where Boaz was from. From the area of Bethlehem. Well, what's significant about Bethlehem for us today? Well, again, now that we're into the, into the holiday season, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about a baby being born in Bethlehem. Isn't that interesting how all of that comes together? And so we see the historical significance, so the historical purpose behind Ruth as well. And this, again, again was all during the time of the judges. When all this is happening, nobody knows anything about God's plan with regard to a baby being born in Bethlehem. But we are introduced to Bethlehem at this time, okay? Which helps us, those little markers along the way that we will see the significance of as we go further and deeper into the Old Testament. So now let's talk about some prominent subjects. Let's first of all talk about the main characters. Let's deal first of all with Naomi. Why? Because she's the first one that we're introduced to when we read the book. And the name Naomi means pleasant one. Which is kind of ironic, I think, because when we are introduced to Naomi in Ruth chapter 1, is Naomi very pleasant? Not at all. She is mourning the loss of her husband. Not just the mourning the loss of her husband, but also mourning the loss of her sons. There, there's the triple effect. There's the trifecta, right? And uh, so she is in mourning. And as she is in mourning, she has some things to say that would not regard Naomi as being very pleasant. But in fact... She wishes her name would be changed to something else, right? That would reflect her, her bitterness and her bitter spirit. But who was Naomi? She was a Jewess of, uh, of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was home for her. Her husband's name was Elimelech. And again, she was the mother of two sons. Uh, and not only are we introduced to Naomi, but we are also introduced to Orpah. It means neck. Now, why on earth she was given that name, we really have no idea. Speculation would suggest that maybe she was one of those people that was known to have a long neck, right? You've seen people have long necks, no necks, short necks, that kind of thing. Perhaps one of the predominant features of Orpah was her neck. We don't know that for certain, but that's what Orpah means. By the way, no additional charge for this. If you've ever, ever wondered how Oprah Winfrey got her name, Oprah, it comes from Ruth. Her mother uh, did not spell Orpah correctly. She spelt it Oprah. She thought she was naming Oprah after Orpah in the book of Ruth. She spelled it incorrectly. Oprah came out. The rest is history. Okay, so that's how Oprah got her name. Okay. She may be. She may be. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, Orpah was uh, a daughter-in-law to Naomi. She was the wife of Naomi's son, Chilio, okay? And also the widow. <laughs> and Orpah was the widow of Chilio as well. Of course, we have to talk about Ruth. We've already talked about Ruth being, uh, or her name being friendship. She is, or was the widow of Malon, the, the uh, other son of Naomi. Of course, she later marries Boaz, who is the great, and Ruth is the great grandmother of David, okay? So Boaz is the great grandfather of David, Ruth is the great grandmother of David. Again, thinking about that Moabite connection, okay? And how God is involved in that family line. So we talked about Naomi, we talked about Orpah, we talked about Ruth. Who are we missing? Missing Boaz, that's right. That's what his name means. In him is strength. Who was he? Well, he was a wealthy Bethlehemite. Okay? He was known for his financial prowess, a distant relative of Malon, the first son, right? Or the, not the first son, but the son of Naomi. He is a distant relative of Malon, and he is the one who married Ruth, and we'll get into some of the details of that as we go. And what's really interesting is, again, remember we talked about the inclusiveness of God using non-Israelite people in the line of David? Notice this was regarding Boaz. Boaz was the son of Rahab. Who was Rahab? Well, remember, she was the harlot that was found in Jericho. Okay? Remember, she hid the spies? And then, as a sign to be protected from the attack that would go on Jericho, she puts a scarlet rope at the window of her home on the wall. That's the same Rahab we're talking about. So isn't that interesting? Descendants of Lot... Moabites are introduced into the line of David, which is the line of Christ, his earthly line, of course, and Boaz, the son of Rahab, okay, 
who is this harlot that, that lived in Jericho, guess what? He's now introduced into the Davidic line as well. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I don't think anybody could make this stuff up, right? But God in his sovereignty, as we've already talked about, his sovereignty and how he controls everything, notice what he's doing as he, it's almost like a chess board with all the chess pieces, right? And he's just rearranging and he's arranging those chess pieces so that the game can continue to be played and the purpose of what it is that he wants to do comes to fruition. I was thinking about that after last week's lesson. Right. And it's so intricate. Now, I have a hard time organizing my day. <laughs> you know, and, and I can't do this. Right. You know, and, and yeah. Nothing gets in the way. Nothing gets in the way. It just, uh, yeah. It's beyond comprehension. Right. So, like I said before, you know, you, 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 there's a famine. What are we going to do? Well, let's go. Let's go to uh, the land of Moab. God's in control of all that. My husband's died, my son's died. What am I going to do? Well, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll take care of it and, and go back to Bethlehem. You know? and, and how God just orchestrates it all. Now, as we've talked about the main characters, we have to get now down to the prominent subject of what we call this kinsman redeemer. This is key to the book of Ruth. Why? Because what this does for us, the reader, is introduces us to more detail of God's redemptive plan for humanity. Remember, we've been talking right from the beginning of Genesis where God has this plan of redeeming humanity, right? It starts in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where he talks about, you know, uh, you know the seed of the woman and the animosity that will take place and, and, and all the rest of it. That's the first hint of God has a special plan for redeeming humanity from their planet's sin. The kinsman, the redeemer concept, and as it's revealed to us in Ruth, Gives us a great, it gives us much more detail on what God has up His sleeve or what He has in mind with regard to redeeming humanity. So, there are two key words of the book. One is kinsman, and the other redeem. That's why we give Boaz this classic title. We call him the kinsman redeemer because what he does in Ruth is he acts as the kinsman. He acts as the Redeemer. And it will show us what God is planning, what God is planning to do through Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at the first word. Let's take a look at the word kinsman. Okay? It appears in Ruth 13 times. Now think of this. Four chapters, 13 times. Obviously, this is a predominant and important word, because as you've heard me say before, if you see a word repeated often in a particular book, God has a purpose behind that. Same with the word kinsman. It appears in Ruth 13 times. Basically what it means is this. A kinsman is one who redeems. Or we would maybe say this, one who buys back. Because that's what redeem means, to buy back or to purchase back. So this kinsman and this role that Boaz plays, right, for, for Ruth especially, what kinsman refers to is this. We're talking now about the near male relative of a deceased man. Who is the deceased man? Mela. Okay. And what's important to recognize and remember is that because Malon had Ruth as his wife, okay, now that Malon is gone, somebody needs to take care of Ruth. Okay. So it's going to be the near male relative of the deceased man who has the right and the duty. Okay? This is expected to buy back land which had been sold to another family. Why was it sold to another family? Because Malon was dead. How are you going to support yourself? You've got to support yourself somehow. Okay? So, most likely the land was sold, sold to another family. And what would happen as this near male relative would follow through with the duty of being the kinsman, right? What that would do is prevent the alienation of the land and the extinction of the family. So what the, the kinsman is doing is he's going back to the ones that bought that land and all the rights to that land and buying that back, redeeming it, okay, as the kinsman. And because he's the near male relative, that's his duty to do that, okay? That's why he's called the kinsman. Would the land have been sold after they had passed away? Or yes. So what happened when they left Bethlehem to go to Moab? What happened? Who cared for that and that? Whoever purchased it. So they would just... Um, they would go back. Okay. They would go back. Okay? So, that was the responsibility of the kinsman. 
Okay? But remember, we also have the Redeemer. This word occurs seven times just in chapter 4. Okay? So again, we're talking about a predominant word here. There's a significance to this word. And it is synonymous with kinsman. That's why we put the two together. The kinsman and Redeemer. So here's what Boaz does. Okay? And here's his duty. As Ruth wants to place herself under the authority of Boaz, okay, to become his wife, he to become her husband, what is realized, okay, and you find that as you read through Ruth, we won't take the time to do that, but what happens is that Boaz is a near relative, but he is not the closest or nearest relative, okay? There is another one that's even closer in relation. So what Boaz does is he goes down to the city gate. Why does he go down to the city gate? Because that's where court is held. Okay? Court is held at the city gate. So all the, the judges are there and the, and the witnesses to hear and what's going on and what's being said and so on. And what Boaz will do is he will go to this near relative and say, Okay, Ruth and her mother-in-law, Ruth is a widow. They need a kinsman redeemer. He goes to this relative and says, are you willing to do it? Because if you're not, I'm willing to do it. What happens is that near relative says, Let's, well, guess what? I don't want to do that. And if you want to do that, let's make a deal. All right? And so they take their sandals off, okay? Because that was part of the culture. And as they take their sandals off, they use those as instruments to seal or, or uh, confirm the covenant that they will make between themselves. That the near relative will not take on the duty of kinsman redeemer, but Boaz will, Boaz will now take on that full responsibility. He becomes the kinsman redeemer. Well, what that shows for us is God's redemptive plan in, in, in fuller detail. In fact, that gets us down to this final question that we ask at the end of every book. So what, right? What's the significance? Here's the main significance that we want to talk about first off the bat. God, in establishing the family that was to produce the world savior, remember the Davidic line, okay, chose a beautiful pagan girl. Remember, she was a Moabite. <laughs> she chose a, a beautiful pagan girl, led her to Bethlehem, right, where she met Boaz, her kinsman redeemer, a relative of Naomi who first made her a family member and then made her his bride. That is a picture of the grace of God in a very full way. In a very full way. Did Ruth deserve what she received? No, <laughs> not at all. Did Boaz deserve what he received? No, not at all. Did Naomi deserve what she received? No, not at all. But yet God in his grace and God in his mercy because he has a bigger plan in mind, right? He has a big, the bigger picture in mind. He orchestrates all of this so that his redemptive plan can continue. So that we can continue to see what God is going to do. Not only do we see Boaz redeeming this, this woman who has great need, right? And, 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 and bringing them together into family. But we see that as a picture of what God does with people who need to be reconciled to Him, right? Do we deserve God's grace upon us? We don't deserve that at all. But what does God do? He orchestrates it in such a way that just as Boaz with Ruth, so with Jesus and us, right? Jesus, what did He do? He, out of grace and mercy, sees our position, sees our need, just like Boaz saw Ruth's need, sees our position, sees our need, and what does He do? He redeems us. He buys us back. He purchases us. That's the act of the kinsman redeemer, to purchase or to buy back. The Old Testament example of Ruth gives us hints into the New Testament example of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us uh, as a kinsman redeemer for us. We are shown through Ruth in this book, we are shown how the Gentiles are also adopted into Christ's family. Isn't this interesting? Salvation is not just for the Jews, but God wants to deal in the lives of non-Jews as well. Ruth, <laughs> Boaz being a, you know, a, a son of Rahab, 
right? Isn't that interesting how God includes them into this, into this Davidic line? In fact, what we find here, Ruth is a great example for us how Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer, as we've already talked about. What Boaz does for Ruth, Jesus does for us, but in a much more significant way. Why? Well, Boaz was dealing, in, and it sounds perhaps funny or it sounds cool, it's not meant to be, but Boaz was just dealing with Ruth, right? And by extension, dealing with Naomi. And that's all his influence had. But when we're talking now about Jesus Christ, doing the same thing that Boaz did for Ruth, we're talking now of Jesus doing this for all of humanity who would choose to come under the authority of Jesus Christ. Just as Ruth came under the authority and chose to come under the authority of Boaz, we ourselves need to come under the authority of Ruth, uh, of Ruth, need to come under the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to redeem us, but the only way that can happen is by coming under his authority where we are willing to accept that redemption. Right? Just as Ruth did, we need to accept the redemption that Jesus offers. And so, what Ruth and this little book does for us, again, just four little chapters. Little pack, though. But yeah, but, but so significant. In, in, in basically two areas, right? Significant in helping us understand how the Davidic line will continue to be formed under the sovereignty of God. And also, to help us understand God's redemptive plan for us and the need that we have to be redeemed. Just as Ruth had that need, we ourselves have that need. Well, when we take a look at it, here's what we find now, right? Little book, big significance. Little book, huge significance. So, that reminds us, let's not take the small books of the Bible and just think that they're not all that significant. <laughs> Ah, we find that they are. Very significant. And we're thankful for Ruth. We're thankful for what it demonstrates for us. And we're thankful that it's been preserved for us so that we can learn even more about God's great plan for his people. There's Ruth. Small book, but big significance. Let's pray. Thank you again, Father, for your word. Thank you for the book of Ruth. As we have seen, and as we've been reminded, this is a great book to help us understand a little more of your redemptive plan. And we thank you for that, Father. It's not something that we can do for ourselves. We are reminded again that it is you that we need. We need you to be our Redeemer. And so keep us, Father, as ones under your authority. Keep us and remind us that we are ones who have been bought back and been redeemed by you. And as we continue in that relationship, we continue to be faithful and we continue to be obedient. Continue with us as we will study in other days. We pray it in Jesus' name.